I remember waiting for our first child to be born. We waited nine months for the day that we would see her for the first time. The months leading up to her arrival, I remember nervously waiting for the unknowns of labor as I waited for that pregnancy journey to come to an end. Now, on the day of her birth, I remember waiting at home until it was time to head to the hospital. Those hours felt like an eternity. The night before, my husband Skip had gone outside to install the car seat into our very small Jetta. And like most new parents, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. So he read the manual, tested the straps, and when he was convinced that it would be good to go, he had come inside to let me know everything was ready. Well, eight hours later, I announced that it was time to head to the hospital, and so we loaded into that little car. The problem was, we had waited at home a bit too long, and I was about ready to have that baby, which meant I was past the calm, zen part of contractions, and I was at the I'm-going-to-kill-you-skip part of the journey. So we get into the car and I'm already very upset at Skip and the whole situation that we now find ourselves in and I settle into the car and then I look over at him and he's pinned against the steering wheel in his seat because when he had installed the baby seat, he had pushed the driver's seat forward in order to make room to secure that baby seat. But now that he was trying to move the driver's seat backward, we realized there was no room. And because I'm screaming that we need to go now, Skip somehow figures out a way to slide himself into the seat, and he begins to drive down the road. But halfway down our street, as I'm yelling at him to drive through all stoplights and stop signs, no need to stop, Skip looks at me with panic in his eyes and says, I have to adjust the baby seat. I can't drive like this. Well, you can imagine that I am ready to kill him as he puts the car into park jumps out of the car and fumbles in the back trying to unlock that car seat from the base, which is not budging. And then finally, when I couldn't possibly wait another second, he wrenches the baby seat that he so lovingly installed just hours before, shoves it sideways into the back seat, jumps back into the car, and races to get me to the hospital before Kennedy was delivered in the car. Now, looking back, I realize it took only a few moments. But in that moment, it felt like the longest wait of my entire life. There's a couple in the Bible named Sarah and Abraham who knew what it meant to wait. When we first meet them, Sarah is 65 years old, Abraham is 75 years old, and they have lived in a state of barrenness for the entirety of their married lives. It's something they probably have grieved over, and I imagine that the rawness of their reality has probably lessened over time. And so they like, have likely come to a place of acceptance and wholeness, even though their life may not be how they once had envisioned it. Now, all of a sudden, in their story, God shows up and writes a new chapter for them. See, God makes them an incredible promise to give them a son, and through that son, a nation who God would use to bless the whole world. It was incredible. I can imagine that their hearts broke open with joy at the thought that they would have a child of their very own. And because it's a miracle, you almost expect it to happen immediately, right? Like the very next day, Sarah would find out she was pregnant. A few weeks later, they would share the news with their entire family. For such a miracle, you almost expect that nine months later, they would be holding their child. But that's not exactly what happens. In fact, years pass by instead. Decades pass as they cling to the promise, trusting that God would do what he said he would do. Now, I'm sure there must have been moments in those years where they wondered if they maybe had misunderstood what God had said to them. See, it would have been a long journey of trust for them, full of difficult and excruciating years waiting in limbo. But even though it didn't happen immediately, God was faithful to them. And we read that when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, she gave birth to their son, Isaac, 25 years after God had promised it to them. Amazing. Now, there's another couple in the Bible who receive a very similar miracle. Many years have passed, and Abraham and Sarah's family have grown into a great nation that God calls Israel. And one of their descendants is a guy named Joseph, who is engaged to a girl named Mary. And they're awaiting the birth of a miracle baby, too. Now, God has been faithful to the nation of Israel that he has created. He has led them, protected them, guided them, and he has also given them over 200 more promises, each detailing how he will rescue the world through Abraham 
and Sarah's family. One time, God says to them, I will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And then during another time, God says, out of Bethlehem will come the ruler of Israel. But then after 200 amazing promises and 1,600 years of walking faithfully with his people Israel, God goes silent. For 400 years, God doesn't speak to the nation of Israel during what the Bible scholars call the silent years. These 400 years happen just before Jesus is born. And for these 400 years, heaven goes completely silent as God's people continue to wait for the fulfillment of the promises. I can imagine that after centuries of God being in constant communication, that silence would have been deafening. The waiting would have felt excruciating. Have you ever been in that place, waiting on a promise that has taken months, years, maybe decades to become a reality? Waiting for bad news that you know will likely be arriving? The slow journey, maybe, of waiting for a loved one's time on this earth to come to a close? Or maybe waiting in silence for an answer that just doesn't seem to be coming? In those moments, the silence can be overwhelming, and the waiting can seem unbearable, borderline cruel, certainly maybe unnecessary. And if we're honest, many of us likely have asked, when I can't see God moving or hear His voice, how can I be sure that he is even there? The truth is that from our human perspective, when we can't see God's hand or hear his voice, our tendency is to conclude that he's not present. He's not working. He's not active. But if we take a quick look through history, we can see that God was indeed at work in those 400 silent years. Because during those years, a few notable things were happening in the world's history. At the start of the silent years, Persia was in power. Following that time was the Greek period, which happened somewhere between 334 and 323 BC. Now, during this time period, Alexander the Great rose to power, and he was dominating the world. Alexander was focused on a mission to unite the world by spreading Greek culture, Greek civilization, and Greek language, which was known as Hellenization. Before this, there were many different dialects, which meant that communication was next to impossible worldwide. But during his time in power, Alexander established Greek as the world's universal language. And as a result, most of the world became bilingual, meaning that they could speak in their own native language, and they could also speak in the Greek world language, which would be very important in the next time period, which was the Egyptian period. Now, during the Egyptian period, which took place somewhere between 324 3 and 198 BC, Alexander the Great's kingdom was split up into four parts after his death, and it, they were given to his four generals. The most interesting thing to note is that during this time period, the Old Testament scriptures were officially translated from the Hebrew language, the language of God's people, into the Greek language. And with this translation, scripture was now accessible to all for the very first time, not just for the Hebrew people. Then after the Egyptian time period, there were a few more kingdoms that rose into power until finally the Roman period arrived. Now the Romans were building an empire. So when they conquered a city, they were known to quickly establish good order within that region. And when the Romans invaded and they conquered Jerusalem, they brought order and peace to the land. We see this when they call a census, causing Joseph and a very pregnant Mary to travel to Bethlehem, along with everyone in the region who were instructed to return to their hometown so that they could be counted by the Romans. Because the Romans were highly administrative, everything that they did was ordered and systematic. And while in power, they also established a great system of roads and shipping routes in whatever cities that they conquered, which made it very easy for people and trades to move freely within the regions. This also made it very easy for information to be shared throughout the cities. During this time, synagogues were also in every major part of Rome, and because the scriptures were now in a universal language, people could study them and know the prophecies that God had given. See, the entire Roman world would have been aware that God had promised to send a rescuer to his people Israel, that a virgin would give birth, and that the rescuer would come from Bethlehem. The reality is that there had never been a better time for the entire world to realize that the Savior had arrived. 
The world was weary after so much political change in 400 years. God's people were weary after 400 years of deafening silence. And a young girl, barely able to comprehend the world realities around her, was about to deliver the promised Messiah, the one who God had spoke of when he promised to bless the whole world through Abraham and Sarah's family. You see, it may have seemed that God was silent for the past 400 years, but the truth is that he was lining things up and waiting for the exact time to fulfill his promise for a very weary world. And the same is true in our lives. In the seasons where it might seem that God is silent, when we struggle to hear his voice or see how he is answering our prayers, he promises that he is working on our behalf. He is moving and active in our lives, never leaving us, always with us. The Bible teaches us, though, that his ways are different than our ways and his time looks different than ours. And while sometimes that might feel like silence, in reality, it is him working things out in our lives for our good. Friends, when we understand what was happening in those 400 silent years, how God was preparing the way for Jesus to arrive on the scene, we then can realize that Jesus came at the exact moment in the exact pocket of time that God had always planned. In the same way, God is constantly at work in our lives, constantly working things out for our good and for the good of this world that he so desperately loves.